Hello, everyone. I'm Kevin Gastola, Managing Editor for Shadowproof.com, and I'm also the curator of the Dissenter newsletter. And I won't have a long broadcast for you, but I'm here to mark the third anniversary, the third year of WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange in Belmarsh Prison, three years of confinement under this prosecution that the U.S. government has mounted and continues to mount against him for the publication of documents back in 2010 that were published uh, and provided to him by Chelsea Manning, a U.S. Army whistleblower, Chelsea Manning. These were documents uh, from uh, on the Iraq wars, on the Afghanistan war, on uh, U.S. State Department diplomatic activities, uh, over a quarter million cables, uh, exposing the manner in which uh, diplomats from posts around the world carry themselves uh, and they advance corporate interests. Uh, they would cover up torture and human rights abuses. Uh, some of them would be involved in frustrating treaties or deals so that the United States could get the best deal or agreement possible, sometimes at the expense of people and the global populations, when you look at the climate deal, et cetera. And so anyways, today is a sordid anniversary and, and definitely uh, worth marking. I'll just put this up on the screen uh, uh, to have as a, an image while I talk uh, some of the demonstrators that have been outside of Belmarsh Prison in London. Prison is attached to a kind of national security court these are where some proceedings took place. Most of the proceedings took place in central London. There were some pre-trial hearings, pre, uh, some hearings before the main extradition hearing that took place at that courthouse. And this is the Belmarsh facility. This is where Stella and Julian were married uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, one of the rare moments of joy or bittersweet joy, uh, but for the most part, all three years have been horrendous for Julian Assange, including the uh, COVID-19 pandemic that brought threats to him and the judge refused to allow him out on bail. But we really need to go back further and in order to mark this day, um, acknowledge what was noted in the United Nations Working Group against uh, arbitrary detention, detention or on arbitrary detention, uh, which was asked to weigh in on uh, this matter. Uh, back in 2015, they actually did come out in support of Julian Assange's freedom of movement while he was in the Ecuador embassy and was there as a political asylee, uh, someone who was there under the protection of the Ecuador government before that government betrayed him. And he was detained uh, and uh, ha had been detained since December 7th, 2010. That included 10 days in isolation in Wandsworth Prison, London, 550 days under house arrest. And then there was the time in the embassy uh, for Ecuador in London. And, and that time in the embassy was nearly seven years. It was cut short of that mark by two months because that was when the Ecuador government under Lena Moreno revoked his asylum and allowed the British police to come in and haul him out. And we remember what we saw. Uh, we saw somebody who looked unkempt, who looked like they weren't taking care of themselves. And that was deliberate. We learned that the shaving kit for Julian Assange was taken from him. We learned that it had become difficult for him to live his daily life. He was cut off from internet access. He was no longer seeing visitors at that point. They had isolated him. They were trying to make it impossible for him to communicate with people and drive him mad. And they brought him out into a van, uh, the po British police did. And then there were personal belongings, personal property, his own personal archive, uh, things that were seized by the Ecuador authorities. And then uh, those were handed over to the U.S. government. And uh, so those personal materials were confiscated. And uh, he was removed and he was taken and he was convicted of the crime of bail jumping. 
uh, simply because he sought political asylum. And, uh, and then uh, he served a sentence. He served a sentence that was uh, pretty close to the maximum sentence that is typically handed out for those kind, that kind of a crime. Uh, and again, they criminalized this idea of, of seeking asylum from the United States. Uh, the United Kingdom played a big part in that. They had the bail jumping charge remain on Julian Assange's record so that there would be a pretext for hauling him away if he left the embassy. It made him impossible to have the freedom of movement that the UN working group uh, recognized as early as 2015 and uh, also made it impossible for him to truly take advantage of the asylum granted by Ecuador because he was never able to leave the embassy and go to some place where Ecuador could truly provide him that safety that he wanted from political prosecution. Confined to the embassy, we know that uh, ra rather than uh, heed the call of the United Nations, when they said that Julian Assange should have freedom of movement instead, uh, CIA Director Mike Pompeo labeled WikiLeaks a hostile non-state intelligence agency. And uh, with uh, cooperation and uh, providing support to UC Global, a private Spanish security company, the Ecuador embassy was turned into a center in which all manners of surveillance were directed at those who were going in and out including the lawyers that met with Julian Assange. His family was targeted, his two children. Uh, well, his first child, his firstborn was targeted. And uh, then Stella was targeted. And journalists who visited, as well as doctors, were visited. Sometimes notes would disappear. Doctor's notes would be taken. This is what happened at the Ecuador embassy. And in Belmarsh, uh, where he has been for three years, and we're marking the third year of his confinement at Belmarsh. Uh, at first, when he arrived, he was not in any stable condition. He immediately deteriorated mentally. Uh, he needed around the clock treatment. He went to a specific ward. He was not in general population. He was receiving intensive care uh, because of his psychological condition. Uh, that was when Niels Meltzer uh, adduced or determined that he had suffered psychological torture and had all the hallmarks of somebody who had endured psychological torture. Uh, he had medical care that he needed immediately, dental care, uh, other physical ailments that needed to be taken care of. Uh, and uh, he was in uh, confinement conditions that were tantamount to solitary for some time eventually released into general population, but then that was complicated by the lockdown conditions of the pandemic. And uh, the lockdown conditions of the pandemic meant that he could not uh, see Stella and his children um, regularly. It was harder to meet uh, and see visitors, and including family. Uh, and then of course, uh, he would still have phone calls that were available uh, but also while being in Belmarsh, it's been very difficult to work on the case, to uh, follow and understand what his lawyers are doing to fight extradition to the United States. And, uh, and along the way, we've had examples of, of, of what we can say are, are, is cruelty within the prison uh, with people uh, committing suicide, at least uh, one or two people being found dead in Belmarsh um, owed to uh, things related to their own personal cases, but also owed to what we could call negligence on the part of prison authorities. Uh, there have been outbreaks within the Belmarsh facility. And again, uh, the, the few times that his lawyers have been able to apply for bail, those were denied by Judge Vanessa Baretzer. And there hasn't really been a good opportunity at the appeals stages to pursue bail. So the lawyers have not availed themselves uh, and, and, and attempted to do so. So uh, here we are. We've got uh, three years that he has been in confinement. We're looking at the extradition request uh, to be discharged uh, next uh, week, April 20th. There will be a hearing. And it will be mostly a formality. 
as I understand it. And this will be sent to the home office for Pretty Patel. And Pretty Patel, the home secretary, who's on record, is actually wanting more powers in the hands of the British government to crack down on British journalists, on uh, people who are British whistleblowers, uh, people in the United Kingdom who engage in whistleblowing and investigative journalism. Uh, and I assume that they would use this authority against people who are like Julian Assange, not from the UK, so, uh, so foreigners. Uh, that would include any Americans that are based in the UK who engage in national security journalism that might be critical of the UK and what they do globally and how they cooperate with the United States. Uh, that their government is pledging to serve the interests of U.S. security agencies and the military by uh, pursuing harsher penalties against those who publish sensitive documents, uh, much like what WikiLeaks did to expose war crimes, torture, and rendition, and operations that uh, suggested that governments were complicit in systematic human rights abuses. And so... Uh, that is not a good uh, prospect that Julian has for being able to argue that the extradition should be uh, denied, that the Home Office should not approve it, because Pretty Patel is the one who will make the final decision. However, it'll go to that office, and for four weeks, Julian Assange's legal team can make their submissions and make the case that, uh, although the courts haven't stopped this, that there's a political decision that must be made. This is the time when people in parliaments in Europe, especially in the UK, can speak out. This is the time when people here in the US can stand up. And this is the time when uh, the Biden administration and people who are in Congress, as, and but, but beyond that, the people who care about this case, the those in the media that claim that they're on the side of Julian Assange, that's when you know, they need to step forward and stand up. There's all these organizations. Uh, you might recognize some of the logos of these organizations on here, but these are all the organizations that have condemned most unanimously, uh, mostly unanimous. If you look around the world, civil liberties, human rights, press freedom organizations, all of these organizations, even ones that you say sometimes, oh, you are too much of a panderer to U.S. power. You apologize for things that the United States does. You're harsh on countries that the U.S. labels enemies, and you're not consistent when it comes to U.S. allies and Western allies. Well, that may be so, but all of these organizations are where they're supposed to be when it comes to the Assange case. By and large, they have made statements that are against what this government is doing, the U.S. government. What was started with Barack Obama when a grand jury investigation was impaneled to destroy WikiLeaks, essentially, uh, to disrupt it, to make it impossible for it to publish further documents of the ones that had the kind of impact that those documents from Chelsea Manning had. And uh, they went about subpoenaing uh, supporters of WikiLeaks, people connected to Chelsea Manning and Julian Assange, going after their digital data, uh, depending on the email accounts or the social media accounts that they had, um, and tried to cobble together a case uh, going through different charges that were possible, not necessarily the Espionage Act, but that was on the table, and came to the conclusion in 2013 that it wouldn't really be possible to target and prosecute Julian Assange at that moment without opening up the floodgates for prosecutions of editors and journalists at American newspapers. So they hit the pause button and then Ju uh, and then Donald Trump and his administration, uh, particularly with Jeff Sessions, Jeff Sessions, who was seen as kind of this like figure that liberals had to defend when he was thrown out by Donald Trump. But he hit the green light um, and uh, the button that that started this all back up uh, because, unfortunately, Eric Holder didn't uh, disband all of this machinery entirely. The prosecution was able to continue uh, forward or be revived. And Jeff Sessions 
charged Ju Julian Assange. Uh, that was when we saw the indictments uh, coming in uh, as early as 2017, the first charge uh, trying to make it seem like Julian Assange engaged in hacking. And then we saw that on uh, uh, in May of 2019, that there were 17 charges under the Espionage Act that would be uh, passed down. Um, and uh, by that time, uh, I believe Bill Barr was the attorney general. Um, and so uh, he's, his fingerprints are on this as well. And then now with Attorney General Merrick Garland stepping forward, um, we have him here in the Justice Department complicit in what goes on with the prosecution against Julian Assange, uh, complicit for everything that is taking place as far as the deterioration of health for Julian Assange, uh, preventing him from being able to be with his family, get married and get married not in a prison. Uh, this he Because he doesn't know when he's going to be able to have such a ceremony, they were pushed into having a ceremony in a prison. Um, and this person lost the chance to marry the love of his life and vice versa. Stella lost the opportunity to marry the love of her life outside of a high security prison because of what the United States continues to do against Julian Assange. And so uh, you know, we recognize uh, the individual injustice. We, we recognize the widespread injustice that affects us all, the people who were journalists, but also the public that has the right to this information that should be able to read these documents and know that there's no threat from governments in any country if they consume and read those documents, uh, and also especially if they have those documents and want to publish them and reveal the truth. Uh, and so uh, thank you for joining as we do this brief little live stream today to mark three years that Julian Assange has been in Belmarsh prison. Uh, I'll pull this down for just a moment and uh, we'll discuss I want to read this uh, statement that was put out um, by uh, the International People's Assembly that was sent. It's been signed on to by, well, let's go down the list. We've got Dilma Rousseff, the former president of Brazil, Ernesto Samper, the former president of Colombia, Fernando Lugo, the former president of Paraguay, Rafael Correa, former president of Ecuador, the former minister for women in Peru, Aida Naranjo Garcia Moca, Aloisio Mercadante, former chief of staff and former Brazilian minister of education in the governments of Luis Inacio Lula da Silva and Dilma Rousseff, Andres Arauz, and that is the Ecuadorian presidential candidate in 2019, Carlos Onanami, a Chilean intellectual, Celso Amorim, Brazilian diplomat. You go down the list, you've got all these people from Latin America that have stepped forward. Of course, when you look at the diplomatic cables, there are tons of cables that reveal the, the wholesale interference by the United States in the affairs of Latin America as they try to chart their own course, try to engage in their own self-determination to decide what kind of alliances they want to form, what kind of, of, of cooperation and embrace of corporations they want to allow, what kind of extraction, resource, what they want to do with their resources, uh, how they want to handle uh, human rights, but also importantly, how they want to deal with poverty, uh, whether they want to embrace neoliberal programs imposed on them by the International Monetary Fund or the World Bank, uh, who they want to elect, whether they want to have people who are uh, more aligned with the Western global economy um, and capitalism, or if they would like to chart a different path and have socialists that they elect, or heaven forbid they elect communists, but being able to elect the kinds of representatives they would like, how they deal with paramilitary forces who are engaged 
in what we would call death squad activities and the way in which the U.S. is backing those forces, the corruption in their country that happens with the complicity of U.S. backed regimes. And these people are saying this is the letter that was written to Joe Biden, written to Nancy Pelosi, and uh, is uh, designed to try and get the attention of those people who right now could put a foot down and end this prosecution because uh, it does not have to run its course. Uh, justice does not have to be played out here because the charges are political. Uh, one administration to the other making different decisions based upon the politics of the moment. And this current administration choosing not to drop the charges because of the politics of the moment. The letter says, we have been paying close attention to the legal process and trial of Australian journalist Julian Paul Assange, who is currently in prison in the United Kingdom, where he awaits a final decision on the extradition request made by the government of the United States of America. The United States of America has a long tradition of defending freedom of expression, freedom of thought, and freedom of the press. The philosophical, legal, political, and social thought produced by intellectuals in the United States of America forms an important foundational framework for the reflection and realization of freedom of expression throughout the world. Likewise, the struggle of activists since the 19th century for this freedom has been a source of inspiration for countless societies and countries. It is precisely in the name of this tradition continually renewed by daily creation that we progressive leaders of the world address you to ask that within the scope of its constitutional and legal competence in respect of the due process of law and the democratic rule of law that your presidency exercise its prerogative of dropping all 18 charges leveled against journalist Julian Paul Assange. With such a gesture, you will send a strong message to the world that freedom of expression, freedom of thought, and freedom of the press constitute an instrument that can controvert the interests of any government, including that of the United States of America. The cases where there are reports of serious violations of freedom of expression would also be impacted by the dropping of the 18 charges against Assange. It would affirm the defense of this fundamental human right, and it would undoubtedly represent a clear and robust sign that everyone can express their opinion without fear of retaliation, and that all the press outlets can give news to all those citizens of the world with the certainty that the pluralism of thought is guaranteed. It's these considerations that lead us to address you, Mr. President, and other American authorities to request that you drop all 18 charges against Julian Paul Assange, as dated today to mark this anniversary of three years being in Belmarsh Prison. So we have this letter from these officials in uh, primarily Latin America, who have put together this letter um, calling on decisive action right now to bring this to a halt of, of what is unfolding. Um, and uh, so uh, again, welcome to the few of you who are here. Uh, a few of you are saying you didn't get the notification that I went live. Oh, I posted the live stream uh, that it was coming and I, I did, you know, this is mostly this is spontaneous. I wasn't sure if I was going to do this or not. So there is really no reason to blame YouTube for this one uh, because I put it out and then I went live in like 10 or 15 minutes. So this will be there archived for people to watch. And uh, we're now at the moment where there are, you know, there's some activism. There's uh, been the demonstrations around Belmarsh prison a dedicated group of activists who are working in the UK to make this a political issue. Uh, there are people who are right now in Washington, D.C. Uh, they're outside the embassy uh, for Ecuador. In uh, They're outside the British embassy, uh, the British consulate. They're outside the Justice Department building later this afternoon. I think there's people in New York. Uh, there's a few other cities around the country in which there are demonstrations planned, uh, Tulsa uh, and some other uh, cities. Uh, of course, it's not nearly enough, uh, but there is quite a lot going on. 
And when you think about the credibility of the United States and what this case has done to the image of the United States, let's take one example related to the war in Ukraine. And uh, I'm not going to go in the direction that I think many of you might expect. Instead, I'm going to sidestep uh, a, a bunch of swirling issues that uh, present landmines land for those who are supporters of this case. And instead say that we have a New York Times report right now that points to a dilemma for the United States. And I think it connects back to why we see this prosecution unfolding against Julian Assange. Because Julian Assange and WikiLeaks exposed U.S. war crimes in Iraq and Afghanistan. Right now, you can't turn on your television without seeing reports about Russian atrocities, alleged Russian atrocities against people of Ukraine. Documented and, and some not documented very well. And yet uh, they want the International Criminal Court to pursue investigations. Uh, they're looking for any bodies that they can find, any international bodies of significance to bring Russia to justice. But meanwhile, in this report, we learn that the Pentagon has a problem because they have to be careful about what procedure they allow to go forward. In the future, it might mean that U.S military officers or U.S. officials could be exposed to war, crime, war crimes prosecutions. Israel, uh, they have to be concerned, could be exposed to prosecutions. They're not a party. We are not a party. The United States is not a party to this statute that provides for the International Criminal Court, provides for co countries to participate in its actions. And so... Uh, it says that people who countries that are not party um, should not have to face cases against their countries. And guess what? I believe that Russia is not a party either. And yet the U.S. is saying that Russia should be subject to war crimes investigations. Well, if that happens, then it's obviously going to open up a kind of Pandora's box for uh, war criminals here in the U.S., who have been implicated in the Iraq and Afghanistan wars. And so that's something that they have to be concerned about because then there could be calls for their prosecution, calls for people who were involved in those um, massive, um, the, the massive amount of civilian death. What about Saudi Arabia and what is unfolding with Yemen? And this goes to the credibility. This goes to the credibility of the United States as much as it goes to the credibility of the United States when it comes to prosecuting Julian Assange. Uh, so the consistency here, the, the, the fact that they want to be a beacon for freedom, uh, that they want to project moral values uh, and get people to line up behind the United States well, how can you do that? How can you do that when uh, everyone's saying investigate alleged Russian war crimes and you say, ah, I don't know. I'm not sure. Uh, we have to be careful. We need to tread carefully. We need to be worried that in the future, people from our country might commit war crimes and be held accountable. So I don't know if the International Criminal Court is the right way to hold Russia accountable for any crimes against Ukrainians. That's where we're at. And it, and, uh, uh, it, it's as it, it's pretty clear, uh, that that's also a dynamic in the Assange case, because in the Assange case, we also have state department officials who go around preaching about press freedom and human rights, how everyone should have freedom of expression in their democracies, uh, if they're building a democracy, and yet uh, they speak up for political prisoners 
in countries that the U.S. opposes, and there's total silence when it comes to Julian Assange. So I've got a clip for you as we wind this down. Let's see an example. I've got a couple examples. This is the U.S. State Department. The U.S. State Department weighed in. They provided diplomatic assurances that aren't worth a whole lot, but they intervened in order to make the extradition happen and salvage the Justice Department's case because it was blocked by Vanessa Baretzer on humanitarian grounds. They went to the British government with some assurances. And so Secretary of State Antony Blinken and others at the State Department have put themselves in a position where they should be accountable, where people who are in the press who ask them questions should be able to get a response. But here's an example of what happens if anyone who's a journalist asks Secretary of State Antony Blinken about Julian Assange. Few questions from the comments. We've had quite a few. We launched some contribution from yesterday. Many questions around Julian Assange. He is facing extradition in the U.S. There have been many calls in France and Europe to drop charges against him. What do you want to answer to this? It's not easy for me to speak around this issue. There is an ongoing legal process, so I will let that legal process continue. I understand understand the questions, the emotions around this case, but I cannot really speak on this issue. Yes, this is quite recurrent, and the question was around how come a whistleblower doesn't get much protection, because this has been a recurrent issue uh, for several years, this issue around extradition. I understand the question, I understand the emotions, but I must let the legal system work. Is that something raised by your administration? Probably because this is an ongoing case. Um, une question aussi ongoing, de, de okay. Danny, uh, dans les Another question from uh, Danny in the comments. Do you intend on closing Guantanamo? Oui, we know you wanted to, but what's the timeline? We, even oui. during oui. other mandates, oui. we heard about closing uh, Guantanamo. But... Okay, so in the go into Guantanamo, which is also relevant to Assange and WikiLeaks because they exposed the detainee assessment briefs. Uh, those came from Chelsea Manning and then were published by WikiLeaks. But what I wanted you to focus on was how he says we have to let the legal process work. Well, first off, Antony Blinken actually did comment on CNN as someone who had been part of the U.S. government uh, before it was known that Julian Assange was going to be uh, officially and publicly charged. Uh, there was still an ongoing investigation and he did talk about the role that he believed Assange and WikiLeaks had played in interfering in United States affairs. Uh, but so now, you know, when there's negative attention to the case, uh, there's the dodge, the uh, refusal to engage and uh, and defend what the administration is doing. Uh, it's coward. It's cowardly. And uh, it, it shows uh, the kind of craven nature of these people who run the U.S. government and, and how they believe effectively that there should be no accountability. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't believe that uh, there isn't a whole lot of difference. Uh, if you want to get down to it, there's probably not a whole lot of difference between the people who are uh, in Putin's inner circle and Putin himself. Um, and then the people who are in Biden's inner circle and then Biden himself, when you think about whether they're willing to submit themselves to scrutiny, um, investigations, um, you know, tribunals, uh, whether they want to be reviewed, um, subject to uh, court cases, subject to any kinds of inquiries, you know, uh, I think that's shared. Uh, I think the inner circles of superpowers feel like they shouldn't be accountable to the people. Typically, when you look at history and when you look at the the current state of of affairs, and uh, and and so you know that's something that the Biden administration has in common with uh, 
the government running Russia's that I think both would like to set their own narrative and not be accountable. And particularly when it comes to the Assange case, it is clear that the Biden White House does not want to be accountable for this and would like to pretend like, oh, it's just it's just something we inherited. It's happening in the background and we'll we'll have to see how it plays out. Um, we'll have to see, uh, you know, where this goes. Uh, kind of like, uh, you know, we'll, we'll just have to see if the flowers we planted in the rose garden outside the White House come back this year. We've been having trouble. And, uh, but, you know, maybe we'll have better luck. Uh, like it's something that's entirely out of their control and up to nature. Uh, what happens next with Julian Assange. Uh, but they actually can do something. We shouldn't accept that. Uh, but anyway, here's another clip. This is Ned Price, a spokesperson for the State Department. Again, I say, uh, maybe the Justice Department can't comment, but the State Department stepped in in order to save the Crown Prosecution Service. So what they were able to go before the appeals court and put forward these diplomatic assurances that were offered by the State Department and uh, to make it impossible, really, uh, when you look at it now, uh, for Julian Assange to have his freedom preserved or to have his human rights protected, really, from being jeopardized. So here, one last clip. Uh, announcements to make at this time, but when we do, uh, and if we do, we'll be sure to let you know. Can um, I think ask you if you, have, if you include Julian Assange in the, um, in, in, in the, the statement that Connor asked about? Uh, I know the Department of Justice is in uh, an ongoing. So, you, 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 so no, you don't. Uh, you don't believe that. I would refer you to the Department of that. Justice to comment on, right. on Mr. Assange's case. Second, se second on, on Burma. And yes, I do ask a lot of questions. But, well, that's but we want to make sure. It's All right. So there he is again. The State Department is not going to answer any questions about Julian Assange. We're free to the Justice Department where you can go ask them your question and then they will tell you that they have nothing to tell you about Julian Assange um, and that uh, you know, they may not even give you the boilerplate nonsense about how the U.S. supports press freedom. And uh, they won't even confess that they don't think Julian Assange is a journalist and uh, or, or that uh, they think that there's a line between what's acceptable journalist activity and what isn't. And some people who go beyond that cease to be journalists and yeah, yada, yada. Uh, uh, stupid nonsense, stupid nonsense. So uh, that is uh, Ned Price. Uh, you saw Anthony Blinken. Uh, you see the examples from the Biden administration of how uh, they're allowing this to unfold. And then so that's how they deal with that publicly. Uh, they, they don't weigh in because they don't want to become headlines. They don't want global attention to the defense of this case. There really isn't one for def when you think of defending this political prosecution it may, may be that if he's put on trial in a U.S. court, a judge would allow a conviction, would convict, a jury might convict. Uh, but uh, before then, uh, as they are challenged, um, they, they don't believe that they think their defense is going to prevent some kind of an uproar, given what they've heard from people around the world, from these civil society organizations that have taken the right stance and position. So, uh, you know, we're here. Uh, we're going to see the extradition discharge to Pretty Patel's office. That's the Home Secretary. Uh, and then it'll come back to Westminster Magistrates Court. I understand, um, and I got this from Craig Murray, that from that point forward, then you're going to see that the Assange legal team may take the opportunity to appeal uh, the bulk of Judge Vanessa Baretzer's earlier decision from January 2021. And uh, so this, this continues uh, maybe another year uh, that there are going to be proceedings in British courts. Um, or, you know, who knows? Maybe they're not allowed to have that path. Maybe they're not allowed to have their day in court and Assange winds up in the U.S. sooner than later. All the while, at any moment, the United States can stop, st can stop this. And, and the more that they subject Julian Assange to uh, the inhumane treatment 
that he's un, uh, been subject to, uh, the fact that this has gone on for more than a decade uh, and it's not acceptable, and the fact that they want a harsher punishment. That's really what they're saying. When they continue to press this extradition, what the U.S. government is telling the world is the punishment that Julian Assange has endured is not enough. Uh, even though most cases for people convicted under the Espionage Act, uh, that they would be able to accept deals or they might be able to serve time in prison that is less than the time that Julian Assange has spent. I mean, what they're saying is it's not good enough. No, we got to have the show trial. We've got to put this guy who's become um, one of these public enemies that we need to display uh, for every American and persons around the world to see uh, that if you cross us, this is what will happen to you. We will crush you. Uh, I know that they were particularly upset when they heard the words from Julian Assange that he liked to crush bastards. Well, they're saying, look, we think um, uh, we, we will show you what it means to crush people. And uh, they've been doing so for over a decade, um, setting that example through their treatment um, and this case against Julian Assange. And so, uh, you know, they're, they're ready to put him on trial and, and hoist him up so everyone can see how they handle him. And uh, by doing so, they're signaling that the punishment already is not enough uh, because over a decade is possibly longer than what he would get. And I know you hear yeah, it's a maximum of 175 years. You could do a life sentence. He could get 20 or 30 years. It really depends on how the sentencing hearing stacks up. Uh, I've covered these cases. And yeah, I know you want to present the worst case scenario so you can get the best possible outcome for a defendant so that they can get off. I um, understand the legal strategy. But just practically speaking and historically speaking, these Espionage Act cases have resulted in sentences that were somewhere between three to you know, seven or eight. Chelsea Manning got a particularly harsh sentence of 35 sentences, but even Barack Obama when commuting said that that was outside the range of what's normal. And that probably was owed to her presence in a military court. Would the same thing happen in a federal courtroom? There's all these questions, but we don't really have to have this conversation uh, because first and foremost, President Biden's White House could drop the charges and free Julian Assange so he's no longer in Belmarsh High Security Prison, so he doesn't have to be brought to the United States and be in uh, Alexandria Detention Center or sent to a communications management unit where he could be in harsh conditions in either prison in Illinois or prison in Indiana. And uh, so this is where we are. Uh, thank you for tuning in to this update. Uh, we'll drop in periodically from time to time to give you some updates. And I'll definitely have something on that Wednesday on April 20th when the, the development does happen and Julian Assange is discharged. Um, I'll be there to dig into what is going to happen next. Uh, but for now, this is the this is the newsletter. Not a lot of postings at the moment. I'm working on a book. So uh, those of you who subscribe are just making it possible for me to uh, bring you that project in the future. Uh, but also uh, in, in, a, in a few weeks, uh, that'll be back to its normal operations uh, sometime in mid-May, I would expect. Um, a big thank you to those who are subscribers of the dissenter who have been patient while I work on this book. And uh, so uh, that is all that I have for you. If uh, you uh, are able to uh, uh, support a demonstration, if you're able to add your voice to any calls for dropping the charges, uh, investigative journalism is at stake. And, uh, this is uh, an, an issue of principle. Uh, we have to be consistent in our support for freedom, press freedom. And uh, even if there isn't a lot of attention to this issue, it's something in which uh, we all must take a stand. So thank you for tuning in. Uh, it's unfortunate that we have to do these kinds of broadcasts, march, uh, marking these on uh, fortunate and uh, 
as I said before, sorted types of anniversaries. Uh, one day, we all hope we could mark the time when we get to see Assange outside of a prison, hugging Stella, hugging his children, allowed to be a family, allowed to live, allowed to move on from this political prosecution. But until that time, uh, there's uh, fighting that must continue and there's the documentation of this case that must be kept going um, by journalists. And I continue to do that kind of work. And I thank you for your support as I do that work. See you around.